which are all negative right now, but stay positive in your mind. Uh, well, uh, you know, you think that, I think that you quote my name, Yelena Kalinic. I am a graduate biologist and I hold an MA in uh, of theory of literature, film and theater. So what I do, I'm a science communicator, science journal, science writer, science blogger, and uh, well, science YouTuber. So I started to write about science in 2013. Uh, my first articles were on Al Jazeera blog. Then I realized that actually they won't publish as many articles as I can write. Uh, during while well, I was in the last year of my master's studies in, in uh, literature, we had a task to write in a subject called creative writing, to write once it was a poem, once it was like short story, and once it was a blog. Before that, I hated blogs. I mean, I, I can't see any point in writing the old online diary whatsoever. But then I realized, actually, I can write about science on blog and use that blog as a, you know, some kind of portfolio to show it to the editors in the region, to show how I work, what I do, and to show them what I can do. So I started this blog, Once in Science, in 2008, yes, in February. And now it's one of the most recognizable uh, science blogs in the region. But then I got, really, I got offers from the Sobergenian newspapers, that's a daily newspaper here in Bosnia, one of the oldest ones, to write for them every Thursday. I know uh, they have like this little piece of the, of the newspapers called Culture, Arts and Science, and they had only culture and arts, they didn't have science, so I became science for that. And a year after that, I got an offer from an editor of Bosnian version of Voice of America. Now I'm like stringer, which means I am a freelancer, but I'm not free freelancer. I, I got my salary, but you know, I have to work for, yeah, I'm not like a fully employed. But well, yeah, it's a really, it's better than being uh, only a freelancer. So I'm a science writer and journalist at Voice of America. Uh, I think that we are losing. Okay. But then in 2017, I was approached by UNICEF Bosnia and Herzegovina. Why? Even when I was a student a long time ago, I really was fighting and bunking bad science, especially bad science about vaccines. I saw students of biology. Uh, being very reluctant, hesitant about vaccines. And some of them were even promoting this first uh, anti-vax BS. So it was tricky for me. Why a biologist is anti-vax? I really tried to go to those narratives, why they are doing that, what's going on. It's most, most, mostly about the uh, MMR vaccine. But then I started to write about vaccines about anti-vax movement and so I was th that was the main reason why UNICEF approached me and then in 2018 together with UNICEF I founded uh, another website, another website called uh, vaccinetouch.com which was like the first time we, we, we had to, I had to write a lot about those Children's vaccines like DTAP, like MMR, uh, uh, to see what what narratives, anti-vax narratives are around those vaccines. But then, of course, in 2020, I had to write about COVID-19 vaccines. Of course, that I wrote about COVID-19 uh, virus and things like that on my blog, Quantum of Science. But the Quantum of Science is not only for the vaccine. This is only for the vaccine. So the first thing was, well, how to approach audience. Uh, when you put a um, like picture of syringe vaccine, it, Facebook doesn't allow you to um, to, to sponsor to, uh, that, that kind of um, announcement. 
because you have, you know, sirens you can be hearing or whatever. So we actually use uh, pictures of nice kids uh, and their parents. Uh, there's like positive kinds of pictures of the bright kinds. So, uh, I'm not sure. These were like, like very positive kinds of image of vaccine. But then for COVID-19, you can see here that I have a whole, you know, many and sub many about COVID-19 vaccines, like types of COVID-19 vaccines, questions and answers, um, side effects, and uh, like personal experiences of people who were vaccinated. Um, and we also try to Oh ah, yeah, this is Pfizer. So for Pfizer, I use this like American and German kind of stuff. And this is AstraZeneca, very Swedish and very British one. So yeah, we try to uh, to do the main picture, main illustration of the of the, uh, every single article about those vaccines to be like you know something that is very nice, colorful. And the things that people will actually grab on, on when they see it in their Facebook feed. And the third thing I'm doing is my YouTube channel. Um, some of those videos about like one minute science, uh, there are whole lectures on uh, chemistry, physics, and biology, like for example, what are mixtures what are assets, what are bases. Uh, so kids are actually using those, those videos to learn chemistry, physics, and biology as like some supplement for their uh, everyday activities in school. But there is a part of it that what I told about being science, which is I'll try. Will we try to find, ah, this is the German science. Okay. Christiane Nissen Pola, uh, she was a winner, she got the Nobel Prize in her biomedicine. And every scientist you can see here is actually my own drawing. And this was done with a little help of German embassy in Baden. I think that Sasha probably saw this one about Evan Schroeder. Yeah. So, yeah, sometimes I use my own illustration, sometimes I buy illustration, but that's a good way really to promote science. And now we'll come to the main point of my lecture, of the lecture. That's how to actually. Um, Right about science using maths. Uh, as I can see, even in the uh, wealthy uh, Western European countries, you really had problems. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had, you know, the paper from French scientists from Marseille, uh, Didier Raoul, about hydroxychloroquine. And it was a huge thing. I was always like, a bit suspicious about that one because those graphs and his work, his paper looked, you know, like someone's kid's work. It didn't look serious to me. And I was very reluctant to accept that medicine as a, a COVID 19 medicine. But in the same time, um, Bosnian government and the other governments, especially in the USA, were very prone to that medicine. And it was, you know, it was pushed by the government. And I think uh, that even in Bosnia, they made a um, you know, whole, uh, they, they took all the hydroxychloroquine, which was used for people uh, with rheumatoid arthritis, and called the um, Sumamed, it's, a, it, it's our name uh, for uh, azithromycin, uh, to have it, you know, if, if they need it for COVID-19, which was a bad science. But not only that, we have a, 
anti-vaccine propaganda we had right now, it's very popular one, ivermectin, and one um, antiparasitic uh, medicine, which doesn't work for COVID-19, and a lot of a lot of people are saying, you know, people are trying to hide this great medicine, but it's not medicine, it's bad science. Oh gosh, uh, I used plum and uh, color. What was some of that? Oh. Mm -hmm. So, what are the credible sources for reporting on science really? And then, are reporting on science uh, any time you can you report about science? Oh. <laughs> have to ask ourselves is why do we need science journalism or science communication in field? Because science is everywhere. Our lives depend on science. And I still think that it's, you know, it, for me it's kind of rude not to understand basic phenomena uh, about science. How electricity goes on, uh, uh, what do we eat, how vaccines work. I know it's my obligation as a member of this society to understand science. I love it, but it's my obligation to know basic things. Most of the other people don't realize that. Uh, but in the emergencies like a pandemic, clear and accurate information from science is the key to survival and saving lives as we serve. But it unfortunately it didn't work, we didn't have it. Accurate information. Uh, we had a bunch of confronting uh, informations. Uh, people were not uh, looking at the right sources. For me, it was always like our first source will be uh, Science or Nature magazine to see what they are talking about. Then H, the WHO, and then those uh, uh, state institutions and. Uh, but. Science papers are my main, main permanent source. The, one of the strongest arguments in science journalism would be a science paper that uh, not all science papers, as you all know, I hope, are good science. So we have to choose which one is good. I always go for those who were, were published in like high impact. Uh, very good peer-reviewed magazines such as Nature or, or Science. But sometimes even they publish bad science. Uh, in 2013, I think, that Nature published a uh, work on um, stat, stat, um, stat, yeah, cells by Haruko Obukata. It was about the stem cells derived from, from adult cells. And it was a huge scam. But it was published in Nature. They, of course, they retracted it. I mean, a few, a few, a month after they published. But it was a snap, so we have to be very careful. Mm -hmm. Seems more complicated though. Yeah. No, it's not. It's, it's there, it's there. So, uh, there are science papers which are not published. I will talk about them. I, I think that you all know about preference. We, do, we have to be very careful about that. But credible sources, I also mentioned, I mentioned Nature, uh, that they also published one scam, bad, very bad, misconducted uh, paper. But the most, I think the most famous uh, example of that, how one high impact journal can make mistakes is Lancet, actually. Because they were those who published Andrew's Wakefield study on vaccines and notice that they retracted it. But right now, uh, even in the beginning of the pandemic, I saw some papers published in, Nate, in Lancet that were like, even I think that, that Didier Roth published his work there. So even with those high impact magazines, we have to be very careful. Another another very good um, source of, of uh, let's say, highly credible, not like 100% credible information, are 
science news outlets like Eureka Art, which is a which is an outlet by AAAS Science Publisher and Output Alert European Eureka Alert and some other things like some blogs. Uh, we usually say that blogs are not credible, uh, but my blog is credible. I, I hope my blog is credible. But I also check on the other blogs, such as Science Based Medicine. Science Based Medicine is run by uh, physicians. Doctors, especially David Gorski. I adore that man. He's always fighting self science. He's always there to say, This is bad science, people. So, but there are, of course, there are for blogs uh, which are, you know, on the edge or crossing the edge. So, you really have to know which blogs are good, which are not. But you learn it while you do work. So, let's. I usually do this with a bit of journalists, so they don't know what's peer-reviewed article. I, I think that you all know what's peer-reviewed article, but we have to really say it over and over again. Uh, so it is a review report reviewed by experts from the same scientific field. Someone who is, I don't know, in particle physics won't review a um, laser physics paper. He's not eligible to do that. Um, scientists who worked on it have published it did not go beyond their field of expertise, which is very important because all the time I see experts here in Bosnia, especially in Croatia and Serbia, they are stepping out their little room of, of expertise. So, I don't know, genetics uh, are talking, most uh, biologists are talking about epidemiology, or epidemiologists are talking about uh, do someone needs to be connected to ventilator and things like that. Whenever I see an expert talking about something about what is not in, in their field, I'm suspicious. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I have to talk about things that I'm not an expert for, but I ask people, I ask other experts from the field to make it more clear, to, to take a statement from them or whatever. Uh, and yes, of course, uh, whoever, uh, a lot of people who here who in Bosnia who, who go study uh, biology, they think, oh, okay, biology is easy, there's no any maths in there, but unfortunately they, they, are, they really stuck to the wall of mathematics and statistics, uh, especially p values, p tests, and things like that. So whenever I see just a paper which some kind of opinion, hypothesis, without mathematical proofs of anything, especially if, if I can't see any confidence interval p value in physics. Most of the physics, in physics you use, I think, sigma value more than than p value. But it's a, the same thing. Trustful to see if something is really that you got you you a moment. Yeah, yeah. But I try to actually simplify, but it's a threshold. But you use it as a threshold to see if there is something in some phenomena. But you calculate it, of course, you calculate it differently. And now we go back to presence. Um, during this whole year, every single media. Used records, CNN, Washington Post, uh, New York Times. They use records as an argument, uh, as a, as a basis for their news. And in science, I think there was an article in Science where they said, you know, people, you you gotta stop this. You know, if you are using preprint, you have to emphasize. You know, this preprint wasn't peer reviewed; it wasn't published yet. Please say it, because a lot of people are thinking something is, they, they do not know the difference between preprint and, and published work. So they think it's like top science if you have preprint. And we all know that sometimes preprints don't even go, uh, uh, they are not published. They are like short. Sure. Okay. They can be changed or until they are published and some of the preprints are never published. 
it's a good thing to have open science because preferences are, are really uh, open science. You, everyone can see what's going on before it, was, it, it, it will be published. But still, the, the, the amount of our, uh, how much we, we have to be careful when talking about published work, we have to be more careful when talking about preferences. And now, this is very important. How many of you know know, know about uh, predatory journals? I think that uh, we have to talk a little bit more, a little bit more about predatory journals, especially in the science community, because I saw scientists who were victims of predatory journals. You know, one day you wake up and then you got a nice email from someone you don't know say, hello, we saw your work, you're doing great, we would like to publish your work. And it's really flattering. But usually the thing is that the mail comes from the predatory journals. You will have to pay for your work to be published, no one will review it, it won't have a like, high impact. Um, you know, those, those journals really publish everything. Anyone can publish anything in predatory journal and say, ah, okay, I have published work. Uh, so papers published in predatory journals are not material for science news and not for science. Don't ever make citations of works published in predatory journals. I use it, I use it for banking. For example, in last year uh, during the summer there was a there was a uh, were, were the paper published in I don't know, some, some predatory journal about a guy, a guy said that 5G is creating a coronavirus in our cells and amplifying that and that was published and there were many other examples of those kinds of things so how to check if something is predatory journal? There are actually lists. There is a bell list. There are many other lists of predatory journals. So whenever I see something that is not New England Journal of Medicine, that is not Lancet, that is not Nature, or Nature Communication, or whatever part of Nature or Science or Science Communication, I check in those lists. And if it is on the list, some even open open up. Uh, uh, magazines are on those lists. They are not predatory, but they can be tricky. If it is on the list, I, you know, I don't use it. Just don't use it. Uh, most of you are physicists, so you are not probably familiar with these terms. Uh, when I'm looking, especially in medicine, when I'm reporting about medicine, uh, I have to seek for highest evidence, and highest evidence in medicine, biology are usually method analysis. They take a bunch of the, of the studies and see what is the conclusion they can get from all those papers. Uh, they do it by making blogograms and things like that. I don't have time to explain, but just look for a Cochrane Cochrane is a, is a really good source of meta-analysis, and Cochrane, their, their logo is actually a blobogram. Uh, I'm so sorry, the blobograms are one of the finest examples of good science, because you really see, you see a graph, and you hit, see blobs. And only by looking on which side of the uh, diagram are those blobs, and how, how uh, big they are, you can see what the conclusion of the meta-analysis. Uh, the second one uh, I like the most actually are double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trials. You know, you have one group that takes, a, for example, vaccine, another group takes a placebo, and we see what's going on. Uh, usually they are on big uh, like samples, but sometimes uh, in clinical trials, so in the first and second phases, they are like in smaller samples of so, uh, less people. So everything else that we can find, like cell culture studies in vitro, animal studies in vivo, 
fragment of solid goods are in, uh, annual studies. IP models in silico, we have to be very cautious about this. I saw many articles, I mean, article articles, I mean, news articles, not articles in, in science journals. Uh, they, they are publishing works like, yeah, uh, bees poison could be a treatment for breast cancer. But it was only done in, in the cell culture. So, you know, you can't say, you can't publish a, an article saying that this is a medicine for a breast cancer. Because it would be something that, is, that works on, on uh, cell culture or on, in animal studies could prove that it doesn't work on a living man or women or kids, whatever. It doesn't have to really work. So another thing that we have to really be very cautious about are any press releases. I always get press releases from institutes, from universities, from uh, Pfizer, from whatever. And they're always, you know, having these good results, seeing everything the best about their work, but they don't put published work. They are not allowed to push published work because of the publisher. Sometimes it's nature, sometimes whatever. And they have to actually say that they succeeded. So I'm very, you know, when I see press release, I will put it in brackets that it, it, the, the, the data comes from the, from the press release. Another thing, uh, abstract and posters from conferences, they are usually, they are nice, they are very illustrative, they're looking good. They are very simple. I mean, I mean, but very simple. It's very simple for the scientists, not for the general audience. But most of them are never published. So we are. It's not like a science. Something that it's a pre-science. Anecdotal evidence. You know that story when someone tells you that he or she has a, an uncle whose neighbor uh, died from the vaccine. And that's anecdotal evidence. I hate it. But people are very prone to believe in someone's uh, personal experience. Even if it's not a real experience, if, even if it's a story that someone tells a story from someone. But people believe, believe it. They are into it. But when you say really facts and, 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 and uh, anything that comes from the scientific paper, they, you know, they are like, I can't understand it. It's more personal to them. That's why, I, that's why I actually, what, what Brad yesterday uh, told us, that's why an anti-vaccine movement is winning. Because they have those anecdotal evidence, personal, warm, or, or, or very scary stories. But it's not the science and as a science you know, I, I'm not able, I, I don't want to write about it. Except in one case, if we have a science paper on a case study, that that thing. But even then, we, there was actually there was in, uh, a few months ago there was a case study of a woman who uh, had an injury. He she was bleeding from her nose because of the PCR test because of the swab, you know, that we, that we put in the nose. But she had some some problem in her nose, some some kind of a, I don't know cyst, and actually the swab really hurt that, that cyst in her nose. So it's a really a one case of that, not a, not a general uh, situation. And now we come to the non credit sources. We need to have our red alert if someone might be the or some outlet promote alkalization. Have you ever heard of alkalization? Do you know what that is? You know that story that you should alkalize yourself because if you are acid, it's very bad. Uh, you'll get cancer. Cancer cells are acid, so you should take like things that make your body. Uh, more alkalized and then they say take a lemon juice and become alkalized 
uh, everyone with a, with a basic knowledge of uh, science and chemistry will know that lemon juice is not from an alkaloid. It's, it's an acid, so you can't really change. And you can't change your pH value well, with what you eat and drink. You really, we, we have systems in our body to regulate those kinds of things. Another very, you know, my red alert is on any miracle cures for cancer or for COVID-19, like I said, this ivermectin kind of a rush. Uh, then all those detox regimens. Whenever I see detox, there is a water which says detox on it. I, I just skip it. I won't buy it, really. <laughs> you, you can't really force me to buy anything with the label detox. And anything that sounds like a satanization of vaccines and classical medicine and promoting like mumbo jumbos, for example, acupuncture, um, what else? There are many, many uh, alternative medicine branches, which I even can't remember right now, but I will then. Uh, any site for portal or website which sells something, for example, um, Mike Adams, who is very famous as a promoter of anti-science, pseudoscience, anti-vax, uh, he is selling his supplements, as well as the Infowar guy, very QAnon guy, Alex Jones. And he's like, he, he's uh, all over vaccines, he's yelling all the time, and then he's promoting like, Supplements for men and those for men are not like uh, those that Gwyneth Paltrow promotes. She promotes those supplements for men, women and they are usually pinky and smell like her vagina, whatever. Yeah, she has, has those kind of things that smells like my vagina. Sorry, but that's a mambo jumbo. But Alex Jones has supplements with a big, big black, very manhood kind of a boxes and saying, don't get vaccinated, take my supplements. Uh, so, other sources that sound scientific, but they do not actually use science methods and stuff. So, these are predatory journals or those sites I mentioned, like uh, Infowar or Natural News from Mike Adams. And you can see the resemblance natural news, and you have nature news. So he's trying really to, to trick his audience into thinking that they are reading like the real science. Yeah. Yeah, it can. So I think how long I think that's it. So now the next speaker, I hope that you were not bored with me. Thank you for your attention.